I thought we'd just start out uh, with my first obvious question. Is this your first Frau ohne Schatten? Uh, in fact, it's my second Frau ohne Schatten, but first one in the theater. I conducted um, a concert performance of it, uh, largely with the same cast, earlier this year in February in Amsterdam, in Concertgebouw. But it was a sort of a one-off concert performance. So basically, you could say, yes, this is my first Frau ohne Schatten. In the how did you approach this, and how long did it take you? to learn the score? I mean, this is a, a lifelong task to learning a score like this. So having conducted now f uh, the total of five performances here, plus the one in Amsterdam, I still wouldn't claim I know the score. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know what I need to know. But every time I conduct it, I discover new things. And this is the same with the musicians of the Metropolitan Orchestra, who have played it a lot of them have played it more times than I have conducted it, although some of them were completely virgin to the piece when we started, because the orchestra is very young these days. But um, the principal um, cello who, who played so beautifully his solo yesterday, he said, every time I play it, I hear new things around me. And I think this is the miracle of, of Straussian orchestration. Um, and I think Strauss is something for conductors who already have had some experience with Wagner. So right. luckily I'm coming, I mean, not luckily, but by choice, I have, I have always uh, kept away from, from Strauss as a conductor when I was younger. Even the tone poems, the only one I conducted um, a lot of times is Zarathustra. And then I came to doing Metamorphosen. So, so I did, did it from both ends, from the very early, the very late. And operatically, um, I only came to Strauss this, this year. Um, I conducted uh, Ariadne of Naxos. It was a fabulous production, Gleinborn. Gleinborn. Mm. And um, um, it, it was planned by me that Ariadne and, and Frau should, should really go inside um, time-wise, because obviously they were written side by side. But I think uh, the fact that I'm coming to conducting Strauss, having already conducted Tristan and Parsifal and Meistersinger, helps enormously. Because with Strauss, you, I think as a conductor, you have um, a double task, um, or maybe more than double, but the one I can see is, the two I can see, are, is to build the architecture of the work. And this is something you learn from Wagner. Mm -hmm. the, the idea of the music drama built from the first note, from the first light motif to the very, very last bar. And, and on the other hand, it's how do you um, underlay this, this massive, massive carpet of um, orchestral texture so that the text, which to Strauss was as important as his uh, music, um, comes out clearly. And in a, in a house like uh, Met, it, it, it's, it's, a real, it's a really mission impossible. Because um, the, the one problem with the Met acoustic is that, that it um, favors the, the voices as such. It's very good for voices, but it's awful for text. <laughs> Unless you're sitting at the very, very back of the orchestra stalls, where you can barely hear the orchestra and the voices get completely compressed like on a cheap CD. <laughs> there you can hear the text, but only there, nowhere else. I've, I've sat in this theater in, in various places. Actually, all my free time I spent going into performances of uh, colleagues just to, to listen to how the theater sounds in, in, in various places. So, having said that, um, in order to conduct the score, you obviously need to know every single line of what this nearly 120-piece orchestra is playing. But this is not the main thing. Conducting the orchestra is not the main thing in this piece. You have to conduct the entire proceedings. And in order to conduct this, this it, it needs some experience. And luckily, as I said, I, I'm, I'm coming to this having done um, quite some um, amount of, uh, of Wagner operas. Um, and also, on the other hand, I've done a lot of Puccini. And the, the piece which obviously feeds directly from Frau Schatten, Turandot, is a piece I've, I've done a lot in my youth. 
And uh, I, I've, I felt that now Strauss, this Strauss, this is a very different Strauss from, let's say, Rosenkavalier or Capriccio or Abella, was really, I would say, up my street. Ed. Do you have any thoughts about this production? I mean, it's, uh, you did it in concert form. Um, mm. It's a production that you walked into, and um, um, yeah, just any thoughts? It's, I've seen it three times now. Mm. I've seen several productions of this opera, but this is obviously the only one I've been working upon. Um, I think it's, it's a beautifully, ingeniously uh, designed set. The separation of the world of spirits and the world of humans is, is really a, a stroke of genius. But I wonder how much more dramatic coherence you can physically breathe in into this piece. I don't know. I don't have an answer because I haven't worked on any other production of this. Um, in fact, this collaboration um, on, on this production, as you know, Herbert Wernicke passed away, um, sadly, um, only a year, I think, after it was produced. Very tragically, he was quite young still. So this collaboration with uh, Knight and Smith, who is, by the way, here in the auditorium, who was the revival director, was a very, um, I would say, um, creative one. Because usually with revivals, what you get is a, a revival director with the book or with the video who tells the singers, you, you stand here and you come from there and, and this is what you're wearing and at this point you, you move over to stage right. It, it wasn't like this this time because I think this production leaves so much freedom yes. to singers to make their individual choices that um, um, Knighton was, was really brilliant at not only managing the singers in the space, but also allowing them with their personality to come to um, full flourish and, and, and feel absolutely natural in this setting. Still, I wonder, had I been involved in this production from the start, back 12 years ago, and had I been enabled to collaborate with Wernicke. I've never met him, so I don't know what kind of a person he was, how open he was to collaborating with other people. Um, because already the fact that he produced this show single-handedly, creating everything in it himself, the sets, the costumes, um, lighting design, ev everything apart from... Color. The, yeah, apart from the, the, the musical side of things, it was a one-man show. Um, maybe there are still uh, certain layers of drama um, which haven't been unearthed by this production. And possibly it's, it's not physically possible in a space like the Met where you can't actually see performers' faces unless you're sitting in the, in the first or second row of the stalls. To me, an ideal place for um, producing Frau and the Schatten in an imaginary future, which will probably never come true, would be Bayreuth. Because this is the only space in the, in the world where you can drown the orchestra and get this mystical effect of the sound coming from all the way, all the back of the set, sort of thrown at the, not coming as a wave, straight wave out of the orchestra pit but first blending with the singers and then getting out to the auditorium, where singers can work with the text rather than trying to always push their voices against the orchestra, and where the singers are really that close to the audience that, that you, can, you can create the ideal musical drama. I mean, Wagner didn't build build um, Bayreuth for nothing. He had a very specific idea of music drama in his head. And I think Strauss was following this idea very closely in his piece, although with much more modern orchestral means. But I, I wonder how much more um, truthful this piece would sound and look in the settings of Bayreuth. We'll probably never know. 
there's almost a cinematic aspect to this piece with all the quickly changing uh, scenes. And I know your grandfather was a film composer, but I, sadly, you didn't know him. Um, I think he passed away the year you were born. Mm -hmm. But do you think cinematically at all? Does this, did any of this get passed down? Well, I think you? anybody, anybody mm, who wrote in the beginning of the 20th century, starting from Gustav Mahler, inevitably um, was preparing the Hollywood yeah. or Hollywood equ equivalents otherwise Otherwhere in the world. I mean, tomorrow we're doing um, Shostakovich with the Juilliard Orchestra here. That, that's another example of a young composer who has been strongly influenced by the art form of cinema. I think Strauss would have made a brilliant film composer. Um, the yeah, own yeah, I would are. say all of Strauss' works, the, starting from the very earliest have this very cinematic approach to cutting and quick changing of scenery. Um, and also the language um, which Strauss um, employed in his music has been then widely used by Hollywood composers. And the, the, the main person who um, in America who, who influenced Hollywood, who came from the Strauss tradition was Erich Wolfgang von Korngold, who was a, a pupil of Tymlinski's, but, but he revered Strauss his entire life. So um, I am thinking uh, about the score very much in cinematic terms, especially Act Two, who, exactly. which is interestingly the shortest of the three acts. Um, but it has the biggest amount of scenes. It's got five scenes. So those who have seen this production know that the, the set is, is moving up and down uh, an and enormous amount of times. So again, Strauss was, like Wagner in his time, uh, composing for some uh, imaginary theater of the future. I don't really um, as assume he, he was um, considering all the technical implications right. of, of, of his writing for somebody like Max Reinhardt, had he come to, to, to staging it. But in those days, in, in the opera, the scene changes were solved with much simpler means than today. I think today we are actually going back at the um, British uh, restoration spectacle of Charles II epoch, where people were, were um, sort of blinded by, by <laughs> the technical capacities of the theater. So looking at this Frau and Schattenham sometimes may think of, of all those Purcell operas. Um, but I don't think Strauss himself would have agreed because for him that was the direct descendants from um, uh, uh, Ring, from um, the, the flight of, of the, the Amme and Empress down to the earth compares obviously with the flight of Wotan um, down to the uh, vaults of, uh, uh, of Nibelheim. But, um, I think, I think that for Strauss himself, this opera became the final um, encounter with the Wagnerian tradition. As you know, uh, Strauss's father, Franz Strauss, who was a brilliant horn player and participated in all the important Wagner premieres of the time, opposed to, Strauss, uh, to Wagner's um, aesthetics violently. So Wagner at home, when Strauss was young, was a taboo theme. Um, so Strauss inevitably became drawn to <laughs> Wagner, and uh, as all young rebels do. And um, I think by the time he came to composing uh, Die Frau, he was sort of over his youthful rebellion. And it, he lost nothing of his admiration for Wagner as a, as a great uh, reformer of the um, 19th century theater. But I think Strauss himself have moved on further. And he's asking Hoffman Stalin in one of the letters, uh, please let it be the last romantic opera. Yeah, I was about the last to quote that letter in there. Opera. I don't want any heroes. I don't want any gods anymore. Give me more people like Barak, he says. Give me more people like Baron Ox. What I find amazing is you conduct this as if you are the major Straussian but you, you have an incredible repertoire. Uh, 
you know, Russian, English modernists, the whole bit. I mean, um, anything, does anything outside of Strauss inform your way of approaching the Frau and Schott? Are there any other scores of types of music? You mentioned Puccini, for example, the Turandot. Yeah, I, I, think, I think in order to, I remember my conversations about Strauss with my teacher, uh, Professor Reuter in Berlin, who, who was a great Strauss in. I mean, he never, he never conducted this piece, but he conducted uh, Elektra and Salome all his life, and, and obviously Rosenkavli and Ariadne and all, all, the, all the famous operas. And um, he claimed that in order to understand Strauss, you, that obviously people will always go back to Wagner, this would be their first address, but he says, they are wrong. Go back to Mozart. Yeah. Strauss was a Mozartian. He was not a Wagner, he was a, a mock Wagnerian. He, he, he <laughs> pretended to be a Wagnerian because yes. it was fashionable and because he right. just liked the, you know, the sound of it. But, but he was essentially a Mozartian. And this is very strange for somebody who comes all the way from Bavaria, as Strauss did, to be that Viennese. So my personal approach to... Well, all his librettists were Austrian and Viennese. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can't be more Viennese than Hofmannsthal. Uh, that, that just doesn't exist. The Hofmannsthal is, is the embodiment of Vienna of the turn of the century. And actually, if I were to stage this piece ever myself, it would probably never happen, I would, set, I would set the, the house um, of Barak in Vienna uh, around the turn of the uh, 1920th century. Because the language they employ, especially Die Frau, is completely Freudian <laughs> through and through. Gods and spirits, they speak a different language. But the language of Die Frau is completely um, every day, I would say, pedestrian language of um, middle-class bourgeoisie in Vienna. Uh, just read some Schnitzler um, and, and, and you, or Zweig and you'll get the feel for it. But it's, in, it's interesting how Mozartian Strauss is even when he pretends to be uh, big and, and, and um, epic. Uh, there's actually another influence on, in this piece which I would want to mention, something I conducted a lot and I conducted in this city. It's Humperdinck and it's his Hansel and Gretel, the world premiere of which Strauss conducted in 1896. And his wife was to do the premiere of Hansel and she sprained her ankle and mm -hmm. had to do the second performance. Poor thing. <laughs> <laughs> Well, every time I conduct the end of Act One of Die Frau, I keep thinking of the dream pantomime from Hansel and Gretel in every single detail but the key. The, the key is, is the Parsifal key, is A-flat major. A flat, yeah. um, but everything else is exactly the same, even the solo trumpet at the end. So this fairy tale world, which Wagner was not so close to. I, I don't think Wagner would, I mean, he tried it with Siegfried in a way, but it's still very much a fairy tale for grown-ups, for adults. While the music, some of the music in, in Die Frau, I mean, I can see it in the example of my five-year-old son, who got completely fascinated by Die Frau, especially in Act 1 and 2, I think Act 3, was a little bit too much for him, so he fell asleep. <laughs> when it was at its loudest, he fell asleep. Um, but Act One, he, he, was, he was really raving about because there is all this magic. So, um, and there is another aspect, of course, the uh, parodistic aspect in depiction of the Ame, which comes all the way from Gingerbread Witch. The Knusperhexe is the pre-form of the Amme in the opera. And musically speaking, it's this absolutely coarse, cruel, and ingenious combination of Wagner and operetta. Wagner himself tried it once in uh, uh, the depiction of Beckmesser, especially in Act Three, mm -hmm. the big scene with, where, where it is really almost cinematically funny. 
but it's it's also it's it's funny and coarse <laughs> because he cruel won, humor, it, yeah. it's very very cruel very black humor um, and Strauss applies the same but on a much more nimble um, light-hearted scale with the Ame and then goes all the way into the demonic aspect so Ame is some kind of combination of Herodias and the gingerbread witch <laughs> Musically speaking, I think on the human level, she's almost the most likable character in the piece. To me, at least, she is. Because she, she is the one who sees the reality as it is. Uh, she hasn't got um, pink glasses um, on, um, in front of her eyes like Barak. Um, she hates those she hates, and she loves those she loves. She, she's absolutely genuine. And she's the one who is um, left completely um, despaired and bereft at the end because... She had done her task and she feels betrayed. And she feels betrayed. And she, she is betrayed in a way like children betray their parents when they go away from home. That's, that's a natural course of events. But I would say the, the only one we really f feel we sympathize at the end on a human level is her. Um, but, and, and this is interesting because we always think of, going back to Humperdinck who created Gingerbread which we always think of him as a Wagner imitator. I personally think that he may have imitated Wagner in the first two acts of um, Hansel and Gretel, but in act three, with the appearance of Gingerbread which he goes somewhere else and had he had more courage, he would have created other great operas. I mean, we know that Königskind is a wonderful piece, but none of them have been as successful as, as um, Hansel. And to me, the third act of Hansel and Gretel has the element of the 20th century cruelty and the black humor, which was, in terms of the um, operatic development, the way forward, the way away from the music drama of the 19th century. But he never had the courage, and Strauss had the courage. So in a way, Straussian um, double face the, the, the epic and, 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 and the drama load, and, and at the same time, the um, light-hearted, uh, slightly ironic and, and distant composer of um, Act Two of Rosenkavalier, for instance, mm -hmm. in this piece is combined in one. People, you know, how many really like Hensel and Gretel? It's a great piece. It's undermined by the fairy tale. It's done, you know, at Christmas time and all that. But uh, it's harmonically a fascinating work. That guy could orchestrate, a brilliant orchestrator. Um, and I just recommend that. It has to be done really well. It has to have, you have to have a light touch. There's a Schulte recording, and mm. when, the, it's very heavily, when, when the house, burns down, it's like Valhalla coming to an end. He's very, <laughs> a lot of oomph But there's a it. fantastic uh, Colin Davies recording with the yeah. Dresden Staatskapelle. Uh, I, I recommend that highly. You must, must get that oh. one. One thing I loved about this performance was the fleet tempi. Um, this was, I would love this, you know, Strauss himself wanted a quicker tempi. And it was, he always talked about it, he complained that Frau was conducted often too slowly. Um, was there any did you use the same tempo in Amsterdam, basically? Yeah, yeah. There is a story behind it. Um, when we started talking to the Met about this uh, production, and I said, yes, it would interest me. Um, let's talk about it. The first thing they did, they sent me a cut list. Yeah. And I started looking at it, and, and I got completely lost in those cuts. I didn't understand how you go from there to there without damaging the music. And of course, I didn't know the music so well. So, um, and no, no, the, the, these are the cards. This is how we do it here. Da, 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 da. And then I met Christian Tielemann in Dresden. Um, we knew each other from a long time before. And I said, Christian, how did you do it? It's a completely cutless. And this is the way to do it. I said, wait a minute, but the, well, I don't know what the regulations are now, but they, they at that time, they allowed me to do it without cuts. So I had to go back and, and say, look, I, I can't really give you any answer now. I have to study the piece. 
because to me it doesn't make any sense to do those cuts. And then I started listening to the recordings and um, the first person I went to was Carl Böhm, of course. Oh God, those are like excerpts. But with, with Böhm, there are three existing recordings, um, the Decker one, the Deutsche Grammophon one, and then the live one from uh, Salzburg. And they're all with different cuts. So he, he kept changing the amount of cuts and the places where he would cut every time. So eventually I, I was, uh, Absolutely at despair, and I remember discussing it with my uh, daughter. I also, I also have a daughter; she just turned 18, um, and she said, "Look, if you if you don't know how to do it, then don't do it." Um, <laughs> and uh, and and I said, you, "You're probably right, but le le I, prob I I I should try and do the whole thing, because to me it seems if it's been written this way, then." it's probably the best way to do it. So I, I, I called the Met and said, look, I'll, I'll, we'll probably do it uncut. And they said, no, well, we have the overtime issue. <laughs> because last time it, it ended sort of nearly at midnight or past midnight when Christian was conducting it. So that was the reason why they started doing the cuts. And I said, look, I will go to Amsterdam. I'll do this concert performance uncut, and then we'll, we'll talk. And in the worst of scenarios, I just resigned from the production. That's it. So I went to Amsterdam, and we did it. And I took the tempi as I found them in the score. Because unlike Wagner or Mahler, Strauss was giving very precise metronome indications to every single tempo change. And I, I just decided, OK, he was a, a reasonable conductor, <laughs> this man. Uh, so I, I let him lead me, because sometimes he even prescribes this to be conducted in two, this to be right. conducted in four. Why don't I simply do what's on the page? And I found out that this actually solves the piece. To me, it completely resolves the architecture question. It completely uh, takes away this unnecessary bombast. And, because some of, of the... Uh, pages are so hev heavily overloaded with um, orchestration that the way to do it is to do it very fast. Because then half of the notes are simply unplayable. <laughs> and it becomes a color, a wash of color, exactly as he intended it. So anyway, um, after this performance in Amsterdam, it turned out that the, the duration of the music, saving the intervals, is three hour 15 minutes. It's only three hour 15 minutes long. So then you, you add your intervals and you have your four hours, but the music itself is very, very short. Every act has a duration of one hour and a little something. One hour and one, one hour and three, one hour and five, but no more than that. So the question was solved and um, under the, um, those conditions that I would keep to my tempi, from Amsterdam, Meta allowed me to do the piece without cuts here. Well, you saved the day. <laughs>